Good afternoon. Welcome at the last session. My story is about change. But not about ordinary change, but about the most profound change you can imagine, transformative change. That is big change, radical, <laughs> fundamental, sweeping change. And I'm studying that for more than 25 years, and I'm also trying to contribute to that change. And one of my statements today is that our planet, our world, our society, our country, our region is in a state of transformative change. But most of you don't realize that. Most of you don't see it yet, but you will see it. The title of my last book was called In the Eye of the Hurricane. More than 99% of the people is in the eye of the hurricane. There it is windless, there it is almost sunny, and you seem to be safe there. Perhaps this rot. But if you step out of it, you feel the force of the hurricane. And my statement is that most of you will step out of the eye of the horizon quite soon. And I hope after my talk that you are convinced that you need to be there as soon as possible. You may be lucky. You may be lucky because you are living in exceptional times. We do not live in an era of change because every generation might claim that they are living in an era of change. But we live in a change of eras. That is rare. That only happens once every 100, 200 years. Last period we had was at the end of the 19th century. Come back to that in a minute. But now we live in a change of eras. That means that multiple changes are taking place in multiple domains in each and every part of our society. In our economic system, in our ecological system, in our political system, in our governance system, in our culture. But you only feel it if you step out of that eye of the hurricane. And I'm going to convince you in the next 15 minutes. There are two major driving forces behind that hurricane. First of all, the current crisis. And secondly, our society is tipping in a particular direction. Let me start with briefly treating the crisis because this one, it is different. Don't believe all the economists that say a couple of years, more difficult years, and we're out of it. Nonsense. The current crisis is a systems crisis, and that means that it will last for a long time because it's deeply rooted in everything that we do, in the way we produce, in the way we consume. We have built up an economy that it's spilling and that it's devastating. Everything that we buy, based on the signals that we get, we are using for a certain time and we throw it away. We throw away more than 90% of the resources that we use. And therefore, we have built up an ecological deficit. And nobody talks about it. Everybody's talking about the economic deficit. But ecological deficit is about five trillion, American trillion dollars per year. That's much more than the economic deficit. As long as we do not resolve that ecological deficit, that will come back to us as a boomerang, on and on and on. So the next decades, we will be confronted with ecological crisis around energy, around climate change, around resources, they are heavily intertwined. But, is my statement, that's a relief. <laughs> Let's celebrate it. That is the only way to transform our behavior in a radical manner. So only transformative change will help us out. You cannot be a little bit pregnant. You are pregnant or not. That is transformative change, physically and also mentally. As a systems and complexity thinker, I consider the current period as a blessing in disguise. Why? Over the history, it appeared that humans have a certain fear for change, in particular for transformative change. If you want to transform the world and its systems, you need to transform yourself. Every system transformation requires a personal transformation. And that is deep down psychologically what people fear. 
They know what they have and what they can lose, but they don't know what they get. So the point is, we need to transform ourselves. We need to become transformative agents, transformative change agents. And only a longer period of crisis will help us out in changing our behavior radically and fundamentally. And that is the good news of the system crisis that we are facing. Perhaps even more intriguing is the tipping of our society. I've been studying it for decades, and I still don't know it for, let's say, more than 70, 80 percent, but there's something fascinating going on. There's something intriguing going on. And let me try to give words to it. The last tipping point era was about 115 years ago, where we in Europe and also outside Europe laid the foundation for the society as we still largely know it. There was hardly any kind of organized education, healthcare, social structures. In a period of 30, 40, 50 years, we laid the foundation for that. And my statement is that in the next decades, we will lay the foundation for a new type of innovative, more sustainable society. We, I say, you and I. <laughs> But therefore, we need to become transformative agents, and that's not easy. So we are entering a new form of modernization process, and we call that in science reflexive modernization, because we are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. You may ask me, how can I recognize this? Give me the right indicators. I have not a definite answer, but if you look thoroughly through, let's say, the different stages and structures of our society, you see them emerging. There is that collective unheimish feeling that there is change in the air. Everybody will recognize that. There is a battle between emerging power, let's say the undercurrent, the undercurrent of people who are trying to build up a different kind of society, bottom-up society. There is a kind of a bottom-up revolution going on, and there are more and more conflicts between those who want to maintain it as it is <laughs> and maintain the power that they have and those who want to build up a new power. So there are more and more conflicts, and there is no clear direction, and there is a lack of leadership. <laughs> that's a topical issue also in the Netherlands. We have a prime minister that shows no leadership at all. He also has no vision. There's a lack of vision and a lack of direction. I usually denote this in terms of an S-shaped curve. It tells you two things. Transitions cost two generations, because you need to tear down a lot of, let's say, existing institutions and structures, and you need to build up new ones, and there's a lot of resistance. It is a power shift. It is a fascinating power game. And you see, we see our in-between two worlds. In the worlds of my parents, it used to be safe. A hierarchically built uh, society, top-down steered, vertically organized, centralized. And in the world of my children, it's much more horizontal, it's much more fluid. They uh, act in dozens of different networks. So it is a bottom-up society, much more decentralized, organized. And we are in between two worlds, in between two cultures. And underneath, there is a paradigm shift that creeps in our society. And the paradigm shift goes from, let's say, linear to circular. It goes from top down to bottom up. It goes from exploiting the earth and destroying our natural capital to, let's say, doing it together with the earth in collaboration, in cooperation. It goes from borrowing from the earth and not paying back to really paying back, really creating values. And it goes from individual driven to collective, community driven. And a transition is a difficult process. It is an evolutionary part and a revolutionary part. The evolutionary part goes about building up and breaking down. And we have more difficulties in breaking down than in building up. So the old institutions, they don't want to disappear. They want to exist. Well, they virtually have no function anymore. They want to maintain the power that they have. But unstoppably, the new institutions are coming up and emerging. And it is a revolutionary part, because society, as we will see it in decades from now, will be totally different from the current one. I call it society 3.0. And it is a creeping revolution. 
you might not be aware, but there are millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people in Europe, even in the Netherlands, 10,000 of people, who are working on it already. They are breaking through the existing walls, the existing systems. They start, as we call it, the do-it-ourselves society. Not on their own. It is impossible that you can do it on your own. You need to function in the right networks in forms of collaboration ships, cooperations, horizontal uh, networks. They are working on it already, and it's growing day by day. But you need to see it. You need to step out of the eye of the hurricane. And I call that glocalization. Glocalization is a kind of a, let's say, logical pendant to globalization. It's going back to your local roots, but in a modern, innovative way. And where do you see that, you might ask me? In virtually every field that I'm studying, in the energy field, we have already 500 energy kind of local initiatives in the Netherlands, producing their own energy in a clean manner. Why not? You see that in the field of healthcare, in the field of construction, in the field of food. It's all about the same. We humans take back, let's say, the starting position that we had at the time that we constructed these sectors. And that is the revolution that I'm studying in and that I'm part of, and I hope that you recognize that. And I'm going to give you three examples of that Society 3.0, where we see already those changes. First example is, I call it forward to the past, <laughs> or back to the future. So we have the idea that we want to go back to the core, <laughs> but in a modern way. Therefore, forward to the past. First idea is about city farming. That was unthinkable five or ten years ago. A couple of years ago, we started with it in the city of Rotterdam, where a lot of people are laughing at it. However, can you combine the world of a farm with a city? Well, if you study globalization, you can explain that rather clearly. Because people want to smell their own food, they want to know where it comes from, and here is what we call from your own city. And it is so successful because let's say, in a circle of 50 kilometers, the food is, let's say, produced, distributed, and lots of attendance for it every day, and now more and more municipalities and cities also want to have a city farm. The green is creeping into our cities. Even a city like Rotterdam, which has its all four parts, but I don't want you to say, let me say it, I was born and raised there, um, but it gets more attractive if the green creeps into the city. Look at the different functions that you are creating, and the sheep on the roof, and there are even new jobs, uh, like the roof door. And we have already roof doctors in the Netherlands who can help you if you want to use uh, uh, your roof in a green way. And not only the green is creeping into our, let's say, daily life, but also the water. In the Netherlands, but in many other uh, countries, and in the future, 75% of the people will live in delta areas. We have built up a controversial relationship with the water, because we have been fighting the water for centuries. But in a new world, in a new order, we need to live in more harmony with the water. So we need to adjust ourselves to the rising sea level. And we started already a couple of years ago with this floating pavilion, and we are working now on a floating swimming pool and floating houses, and my ultimate dream is to construct a floating city. And this is only one manifestation, there are multiple uh, manifestations. But the point is, can we no longer only fight the water, but live in harmony with the water? Everything is different on the water, a different rhythm, different kind of culture. And my last example is, let's say, the most intriguing. All the buildings that we have built all over the world, we do not use the surface areas of those buildings or houses or whatever. There is in the Netherlands two and a half billion square meters of surface area that we don't use. If we use that, for instance, for generating uh, electricity or energy in general, we don't need big power energy stations anymore. There was an invention done by a Dutch pioneer, and he called it a chameleon. So that's a rotating front system, and that changes the colors of buildings. That means that you have not one front, but multiple fronts. So each front you can use for a particular function. 
If it is sunny, you can use, let's say, the solar panels and generate uh, uh, power. But if it is a foggy day, this is even able, if you use the grass or the moss site, to filter the clean air. And it is already working. It is already working because there is a building, a sustainability factory that will be opened in a couple of weeks in Dordrecht. And here it is already functioning. And the whole idea behind it reflects a philosophy. Why don't we use all those square meters that we have available. That is a kind of a mental shift we need to go through. That's a famous quote of uh, Johan Cruyff, one of the famous football players. Once you have seen <laughs> it, you will understand it. But now I come back to you and myself. <laughs> How can we expedite this transition? How can we accelerate this transition? Let's suppose that you have seen it, or you had already seen it, or at least by now. What is then your particular role in this disorganized, horizontal, bottom-up neo society? Well, the intriguing part is there's no definite solution. I can only convey some insights based on 25 years of research. No answers, only insights. One of the insights is you need to free yourself from the old institution that requires courage. You need to be courageous. There's a lot to be lost. And you need to accept uncertainties that are part of, let's say, society 3.0. And you need to develop skills and tools useful for that society. And everybody is asking for leadership. Everybody. But we are looking into the wrong direction. We are looking at our prime minister. We are looking at Obama. The leadership is in ourselves. <laughs> it's in ourselves. You need to accept then that connecting is a powerful form of steering. And facilitating that is a powerful form of leadership. If you are able to connect ideas, to connect people, to connect financial innovative streams, you are a potential leader. And the only thing we expect from the government is facilitating that. Facilitating that. There is already, already enough in terms of ideas and potential. With facilitating, I mean creating role-free zones for entrepreneurs, for connectors. Breeding grounds in which we can experiment. There's no blueprint for society 3.0. There's no blueprint. We thought that there were blueprints in the past. There's no blueprint. The only thing we can do is searching, learning, and experimenting, and we definitely need breeding grounds for that. And I call that a new form of governance, organic governance, moving with the transformative type. So I hope that after my talk, if you're not we're already doing it, want to become part of that fascinating bottom-up movement. We can make the difference. But then we need to transform ourselves into transformative change agents. There's no recipe, but there are hundreds of thousands of people already practicing it. Thank you very much.